Welcome to Lesson 22. G. G, G it's going to be a great lesson. Yeah, G with. We're on Colossians. In Lesson 22, we're doing the design of Paul's epistles. And we're covering where in uh, 1 Corinthians 13, 13, Paul says, Now abide at these three, faith, hope, charity, and the greatest of these is charity. And he spits Romans through Galatians, given the faith doctrine. Ephesians through Colossians, given the charity doctrine. First and Second Thessalonians is on hope. First Timothy through Philemon is instruction and righteousness. And in each set of doctrine, you've got for, uh, for the love doctrine, you have the doctrine itself in Ephesians. The reproof of that doctrine in Philippians, or the practical application. And then Colossians is the correction of it. So a lot of what you see in Colossians, you're going to see parallel in Ephesians. For example, in Ephesians 1, that's where we learn that there are different positions in heavenly places. It says... In verse 20, Ephesians 1.20, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. And hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. The only other place in Scripture where it mentions these different structures and heavenly places is in Colossians 1. Colossians 1.16 1, says, For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. So you've got Ephesians 1 talking about this governmental structure and, and heavenly places. And Colossians 1 talks about the same thing. Uh, you may wonder, well, if these are books about love, why are we talking about governmental structure? We usually don't coordinate government and love together. Well, the reason is because in 1 John, in 1 John 4, verse 7, it says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God, he that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. God is love, it says. And notice, we are told to love one another, for love is of God. So, and when God made the heaven and the earth, He gave man dominion over those things. Hebrews 2 Hebrews 2, verse 6, Hebrews 2, 6, But one in a certain place testified, saying, What is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that thou visitest him? Thou madest him a little lower than the angels, thou crownest him with glory and honor, and didst set him over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. But now we see not yet all things put under him, but we see Jesus. Um, okay, and then you've got, going back to Colossians 1. What we read about Christ there, you go back to verse 15, Colossians 
talking about Jesus Christ, it says, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. Verse 19 says, it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell, and having made peace through the blood of, the, of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. And if you look in Ephesians 1, verse 10, Ephesians 1, 10, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. And then if you look in Isaiah 66, I'm going to get a point to all this pretty soon here. Isaiah 66, verse 1. Thus saith the Lord, the heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. Where is the house that ye build unto me, and where is the place of my rest? For all those things hath mine hand made, and all those things have been, saith the Lord. But to this man will I look, even to him that is poor, and of a contrite spirit, and trembleth at my word. Okay. So basically, what's going on here, you think of, let's say, Sam Walton, for example. He started Walmart. He was a man who instituted his policies and how he would run a business, and he did it differently than anyone else, or I shouldn't say anyone, but differently than most people. And he ended up succeeding at that business. You look at somebody like Walt Disney. You know, he did the same thing. Started a business, did it different than anybody else. And he ended up succeeding. The company Walmart, the company Disney, are both still around. But those leaders have died off. And the organizations have changed. Wow! <laughs> If you can't figure out, our allergies are out of control. Something's blooming. <laughs> so when you have an organization, you instill it with your beliefs and things that you want, and maybe it do, you do a good job at that organization, it works out. But there's a time where you pass away, you can't work it anymore, someone else has to do it, and they have different values, different ways of running it, and so the business, it may or may not survive, but it keep, it's, it's different. Well, what God did, He did the same thing, basically. When God created man, the reason He created man, 1 John 4, 8 says, God is love. We read that earlier. And God says basically, love, we've read that, 1 Corinthians 13, love is patient, love is kind, does not envy, does not boast, is not proud, is not rude, is not easily angered, all those things in 1 Corinthians 13. And God says, I want to demonstrate all of those things, love, charity, I want to demonstrate that. And so I am going to do it by creating this new species that I call man. And I am going to have my love come through man. That's what we read in Hebrews 2. What is man? Thou art mindful of him, the son of man that thou visitest him. Thou hast made him a little lower than the angels. Thou crownest him with glory and honor. Thou hast put all things under his feet. So God made man. God is love. He wants his love to come through man. The only way that works is if we are a pure vessel for God to demonstrate his love through us. Because if I get involved with my emotions or anything that I want, my pride, my whatever it is, 
then the result is you don't have the love of God coming through me as well as it could be. So God made Adam. He says, I'm going to demonstrate my love through Adam. But it didn't work because Adam sinned. So then God made the second Adam, the Lord Jesus Christ, the only set, only the second person ever made without a sin nature. And God says, I'm going to demonstrate my love through Jesus Christ. And that worked. So he started with a man, Adam. If he'd have started with Eric, Lana, anybody else, we would have done the same thing as Adam. Maybe a little sooner we would have sinned, or maybe a little later he would have sinned. Either way, we would not have been the perfect vessel through which God could demonstrate his love through all eternity. I read Isaiah 66. Heaven is my throne, earth is my footstool. Where is the house you will build for me? Where is the place of my rest? And then he says, All those things hath mine hand made, and all those things have been, saith the Lord. But to this man will I look, even to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit, and trembleth at my word. What he's saying is that the place of my rest, the Lord says, basically, since God is love, the place of rest for God is a place where he can demonstrate his love throughout all eternity. And he made man through which he wanted to do that. He says, David says, I'll build a house for you. And... God says, well, you're bloodied, so you can't do it. Your son will do it. But then Solomon does it, and when he dedicates the temple, he says, the heaven of heavens cannot contain you, much less this house that I build for you. I don't know if I can find it. I'm thinking 1 Kings 7 is where he says that. Maybe, maybe not. No, I think it's later. That's where it talks about the building of the temple. It must be later on when he dedicates it with the prayer. No, can't be that late. I'm going to read a bone now. It must be before. Uh, it's a long chapter. Chapter 7 is a long chapter. Here is the prayer. It's in chapter 8. He asks the question in verse 27, 1 Kings 8, 27. But will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, the heaven and heaven of heavens cannot contain thee, how much less this house that I have builded. Churchianity thinks, has so much pride that they think that they are serving God, that they have built a temple for God. They invite God's presence to come into the house, the church, the temple, whatever they call it. And they say, God is going to dwell here, and God's going to fill me with his presence, and I'm going to feel great. That's not what love is. That's an emotional type thing. And it's based in the pride, in my own pride, in my own flesh. Thinking that I will somehow serve God or God will somehow come through me. Solomon says, the heaven and heaven of heavens cannot contain thee. How much less this house that I have builded. Solomon's temple was, had tons of gold, and silver, precious stones built according to the pattern that God wanted him to build it. He was the richest man on earth, and he used those riches to build a house for God. This has got to be man's greatest achievement, when you think about it, to build a house for God to be in, for God to meet with his people. And yet, the best man could do, being the richest man, getting all that gold, you know, it says that, 
666 talents of gold were uh, given to Solomon every year as a tribute. Talent of gold is approximately 110 pounds. 110 times 666, what is that? 660 is about, about 70,000 pounds of gold a year. 70,000 pounds of gold. He's got the cedars of Lebanon. He's got the ships coming in from Tarshish. He's got all the treasures of this earth being brought to him to build a house for God. The best man could ever do using all the resources man has given, God has given man, concentrated to build this temple. And he makes a statement. The heaven and heaven of heavens cannot contain thee, how much less this house that I have built it. God dwells, because God is love, what God is looking to dwell in is Isaiah 66. When he said in verse 1, Where is the house that ye build unto me? And where is the place of my rest? That statement in Isaiah 66 was made by the Lord after that temple that Solomon built. The answer to where the temple of the Lord is, is in verse 2. For all those things hath mine hand made, and all those things have been, saith the Lord. But to this man will I look, even to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit and trembleth at my word. The person who builds the Sistine Chapel or Notre Dame or any of these great cathedrals or mega churches today or whatever, whatever buildings, that's not someone poor and of a contrite spirit that trembleth at my word. The way God shows His love for all eternity is not in a temple made by hands. He dwells in the person, Him, that is poor and of a contrite spirit and trembleth at my word. That person ends up being the Lord Jesus Christ. In Matthew chapter 11, Matthew chapter 11. Yeah, I got it right. Jesus says in verse 29. Let's start in verse 28. Matthew eleven twenty-eight. 28. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Rest comes from being meek and lowly in heart. God said over there in Isaiah 66, where is the place of my rest? He says, I will look to the one who is of poor and a contrite spirit. Jesus Christ is made as a man. God gives dominion of heaven and earth to Jesus Christ. And he says, because he is meek and lowly in heart, he lived without sin. He never exalted himself up. He never had pride. Jesus Christ, I'm sorry, God looks at Jesus Christ and Isaiah says that when he made his soul an offering for sin, that God was satisfied with that. And when God raised Jesus from the dead, he says, this is the temple that I have made to dwell in for all eternity to be the place of my rest. So when God gives man dominion over heaven and earth, he does so so he can demonstrate his love through man for all eternity. But he has to have a perfect man, one who is of a poor and contrite spirit, meek and lowly in heart. Adam failed at that, and anybody else, if we didn't have the sin nature, we still would have failed at that. Jesus Christ did not fail. Jesus Christ is the one. Over in Zechariah chapter 5, they have come back at this time in Zechariah 5. Israel has come back 
from 70 years of Babylonian captivity and they have built the temple, rebuilding Solomon's temple. It doesn't look nearly as good as the other one. And God says over there, <laughs> chapter 6, Zechariah 6, 12, Speak unto him, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, Behold the man whose name is the branch. The branch is in all capitals there, branch. That's because this is a reference to the Lord Jesus Christ. And he shall grow up out of his place, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. Even he shall build the temple of the Lord, and he shall bear the glory, and shall sit and rule upon his throne, and he shall be a priest upon his throne, and the council of peace shall be between them both. Heaven is my throne, earth is my footstool, where is the place of my rest? I look for the man who is of the poor and contrite spirit. Jesus Christ is the man who fits that bill. And so because of that, it's not Solomon who built the temple, or Zerubbabel and Joshua when you're in the book of Zechariah. It's not Moses who did it back in the wilderness. It's not the Antichrist who will do it in the book of Revelation. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the one who builds the temple. Basically what it is, go back to Ephesians 1. God is interested in displaying his love through man for all eternity. That man that he displays his love through is the Lord Jesus Christ. And remember what we read in Matthew 11. He says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly of heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. God says, Where is the place of my rest? The place of my rest is a sinless temple of man, because uh, man as the temple, because God made man to de demonstrate his love throughout all eternity. And only a sinless, perfect, holy temple would be a place for God to rest in. Jesus Christ found rest in that, and he calls Israel, Come unto me, all you that are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. They will rest in Jesus Christ. Ephesians 1 that's why he says in 1 verse 20, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him in his own right hand in the heavenly places. When God, in Genesis 1, 1, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. The place of rest in heaven, heaven is my throne, earth is my footstool. So, if you're sitting on the throne and you got a footstool, the place of God's rest is going to be the throne and the footstool. They're both resting places. So God made heaven and earth as a resting place for his love to be demonstrated throughout all eternity. And he can only rest in perfect holiness. Sin would cause grief, would cause pain for God, being holy. It would cause imperfect love. So he makes Jesus Christ the man. Jesus Christ lives the perfect life. Jesus Christ is the temple of the Lord. He builds it. He is the place of rest. For Israel, they are going to be in Christ on earth. For the church, the body of Christ, we are going to be in Christ in heaven. So that's why it says in Ephesians 1.20, set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. far above all principality, power, might, dominion, and every name that is named. Remember, Jesus says he's going to build the temple of the Lord. So Christ is the place of rest. But God isn't, doesn't have selfish love. 1 Timothy 2.4 says God wants all men to be saved and to come into the knowledge of the truth. 
Christ was that perfect man and is the temple of God where God can have his rest. And God's rest really means demonstrating his love through Christ for all eternity. And God, Romans 5, 8 says, God commended his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's why Christ died on a cross. Is so it wouldn't just be God demonstrating his love through Christ for all eternity, but he would also demonstrate his love through us, those who believe him, those who believe the gospel. That's how God commends his love toward us and that he is willing to take us and place us into Christ. So that's why it says, when he set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, well now, God says, great, here is my temple, the Lord Jesus Christ, and I'm going to demonstrate my love through the Lord Jesus Christ for all eternity. It's going to be the place of my rest in heavenly places. Just like the bride of Christ, Israel is going to be the place of, of God's rest on earth. Earth is his footstool. Heaven is his throne. The throne is going to be heavenly places. And he has this structure. Far above all principality, power, might, dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. This is why the structure, I mentioned like Sam Walton, or uh, who was the other one I mentioned? Walt Disney. Disney. They have a structure, they have, they have an idea of what they're going to do in their company, and they come out and do it, and then they put people in there that go along with that. They'll have, you know, make sure you obey, like, for example, I grew up close to Disneyland. I know that at that time, anyway, Walt Disney says you got to be clean cut, clean cut. It required all workers, all the men, of course, to be clean shaven. Every day they showed up for work. That was a Walt Disney standard. Other companies don't have that. That's something he wanted to do. God wants to demonstrate his love through Christ for all eternity. And Christ is the head of this organization. And it says in verse 22, "...hath put all things under his feet, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all." So the Lord Jesus Christ is sort of like the Walt Disney, or the, now I forgot, the Sam Walton. That's the leader of the organization. And he's going to instill his values, which is basically showing forth God's love for all eternity. For us today, the dispensation of grace in heavenly places. For Israel on the earth. So Christ is going to, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Christ is going to fill all those positions and principalities, power, mights, and dominion, every name that is named with us, the church, the body of Christ. So when Jesus said over Zechariah 6, the branch, well, God says that the branch is going to build the temple of the Lord. What it means is that Christ is the temple, and then he is going to fill that temple with those who will perfectly demonstrate God's love through him for all eternity. But of course, I mentioned Sam Walton or Walt Disney, the people they get in their organization, they may obey those rules. Some of them aren't going to do it perfectly. They have other ideals going on. Then when Sam Walton or Walt Disney dies, someone else comes in. They still call it the same company. The ideals are a little different. The great thing about God, though, is he's eternal. See, that's why he made man to live for all eternity. If he made man and we were just going to live a million years, let's say, we could demonstrate God's love for a million years. Now he's got to come up with something else. We have to be placed into Christ because Christ obeyed God perfectly. He had faith in the Father all the time. The only way we are going to demonstrate God's love for all eternity is if we are placed into Christ, and Christ does that through us. And he will do that for all eternity. So, Christ never dies, just like Walt, Walt Disney and <laughs> Sam Walton died. 
<laughs> you just have problems with them. <laughs> they died. Jesus Christ is never going to die. Walton and Disney were imperfect in getting their laws or what they wanted the people to do down to the other people. But Christ is perfect. He lives forever. That's why Ephesians 5, verse 25, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy without blemish. See, Christ does all of the work. He builds the temple of the Lord. He makes us to the point that we are perfect. Not that we're sinless in this life, but in heavenly places we will be. And He is able to fill all those positions in heavenly places, Ephesians 1, 21, the principalities, the powers, the might, the dominion, and every name that is named. So that now, with all those together, it ends up growing into the perfect temple for God to demonstrate His love through us for all eternity. That's why Ephesians 2 says, verse 19, Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints, and of the household of God. You're part of that temple, part of God's house. And are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, because he is the head, Ephesians 1.22. Verse 21 now, Ephesians 2.21, In whom all the building, that's the temple that Jesus builds, fitly framed together, groweth unto a holy temple in the Lord. It grows in love. In whom you also are builded together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. Okay, so hopefully what we've done, you can go back to Colossians 1, and I've spent 30 minutes on this, but I think it's important because the reason Ephesians 1 and Colossians 1 both mention the governmental structure is that that is how God is going to demonstrate His love throughout all eternity. He gives the analogy of a body. For the body, and we are the body of Christ, for the body to work perfectly, he says over in 1 Corinthians 12, if one member suffer, the others suffer with it. Hey, if you stub your pinky toe, and you, you bruise it, it's black and blue, it looks terrible. I mean, it's just so small compared to the rest of your body. But, I mean, you really notice it. Your head tells you that hurts. And you end up, your leg, you know, if it's on the right side, you end up limping a little bit because your leg is limping to try to avoid the pain. And it affects the entire body from head to toe, literally, when that is suffering. It's only when the body is operating perfectly without pain that everything is going well. You know, if you have just a little pain, you could be in a bad mood. It's hard to overcome that sometimes. The more pain it is, the harder it is to get out of that bad mood. But if the body is working perfectly, then everything is fine. What Jesus Christ is doing is He is saving us not to just give us a place in heaven, but He is building the temple of the Lord. And there are different ways through which love can be demonstrated, just like there are different ways for my body to function properly. My hand can do certain things that my feet can't do. My knee can do certain things that my, my elbow can't do. It's, it's all these different parts working together. And without all the parts working perfectly together, then the body isn't functioning correctly at its full capacity. God wants a perfect functioning body of Christ in heavenly places through which He can demonstrate His love throughout all eternity. That's why that governmental structure there is given in Ephesians 1 and Colossians 1. And you'll see other verses in here. You see in Colossians 2, verse 9. 
For in him, in Christ, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. See, he is the one building up the temple of the Lord. And as people are saved and they get that sound doctrine, he says, great, this person can be used as a, a finger in the, in the body for all eternity. And it has this other person say, great, that can be used as part of the hip for all eternity or whatever. Uh, you get the idea. And then once all that is filled up, then he says, okay, rapture of the church. I've built the temple of the Lord. I've got all the members that I need and they're all functioning properly so that God's love can be demonstrated throughout all eternity. So Colossians is really the correction of that bad love doctrine from, or not applying the love doctrine correct, not understanding the love doctrine of Ephesians. And that's why you need to understand this structure. You know, over in Ephesians 1, or Ephesians 3, when he mentioned that, he says in verse 16, he prays that God would grant you, according to the riches of His glory, to be strengthened with might by His Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge. In between love of verse 17 and love of verse 19, is comprehending the breadth, the length, the depth, the height, that whole governmental structure, comprehending what God is going to do in heavenly places through us for all eternity, how God will demonstrate His love through us for all eternity. And so when he gets to Colossians, and he's correcting the people at Colossae for not understanding the Ephesians doctrine, he's got to go back to that governmental structure. So that's what he talks about there in Colossians 1. And then in Colossians 2, verse 9, In him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. And you see what he did. How did he make you fit in the body of Christ for, for God to demonstrate his love through you for all eternity? When in your flesh dwells no good thing, and all your righteousness are as filthy rags. How did he take that what we saw in Ephesians 5, by the washing of the water by the word. We can see what he had to do at first. Colossians 2.11, And whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, and putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein also you are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead, and you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the hand writing of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. So that talks about what happens the moment you're saved, all the things he does for you. Why? Well, verse 15, having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. In other words, the Lord Jesus Christ says, I'm going to build the temple of God in heavenly places through which God is going to demonstrate his love through all eternity. The book of Job says the heavens are unclean in his sight. The heavens, the governmental structure in heavenly places right now are not fit for God to demonstrate his love through because Revelation 12 tells us that Satan and a third of the angels rebelled against God. So God's love cannot be shown through them when Lucifer says, I will be God. I will exalt my throne. I will be above all these people. I will be God. God is looking for someone meek and lowly in heart of a poor and contrite spirit. What Jesus Christ did on the cross is he spoiled principalities and powers, triumphing over them in it. The love of God came through on that cross to triumph over the, the law of sin and death that was contrary to us. And Christ took it out of the way through his death on the cross so that we are no longer under the law of sin and death, but we're under the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Satan and his forces are all under the law of sin and death because they committed sin, they get death. Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is death. So Jesus Christ, so God says, I can't demonstrate my love for all eternity 
through the structure in heavenly places right now due to the law of sin and death operating with Satan and a third of the angels. Christ comes, he commends, God commends his love toward us, dying for our sin, to break the stronghold of death over us. 1 Corinthians 15 says, Death, where is thy sting? Grave, where is thy victory? Thanks be to God which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ spoils principalities and powers, triumphing over them in the cross, which means that the law of sin and death was operating in a third of the heavenly structure that is rebuilding against God. Jesus Christ wins the victory over death for us. So now all those who accept God's love, because God commended His love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, all those who accept the love of God through the cross work of Christ, God says now, Romans 8, 2, you are not under the law of the law of sin and death anymore. You are under the law of spirit of life in Christ Jesus. So then Christ can say, okay, now I can take those third of the angels. Revelation 12 says halfway through the tribulation period, Michael and his angels are going to fight against the devil and his angels, and Michael and his angels are going to win. The devil and his angels are going to be cast down to the earth. Now, a third of the heavenly positions are open, and the church, the body of Christ, goes in there. Christ inserts us in there because the law of sin and death no longer applies to us. We have the law of the spirit of life thanks to Christ triumphing over death for us through the cross and taking away that law against us, nailing it to his cross. So now the temple of God is fully built, fully complete, because he could take the body of Christ and put us in there to substitute for the devil and his angels. So now the heavenly places are clean in God's sight, and now God can fully demonstrate his love through us for all eternity. But again, you've got to have all those different things. Principalities, powers, mites, dominions, thrones. There are all these structures, just like I mentioned, Disney and Sam Walton. Walton. I can't get them for some reason. Good thing I didn't go to three or four people. We'd really be lost. They say, okay, I got this organization. Now I need a chief financial officer, chief operating officer. I need somebody over marketing. I need somebody who will... Um, manage each store. I need somebody who will handle distribution, who will handle inventory, who will handle the, the cash part of it, who will clean the bathrooms, who will, you know, all these, greet the people as they come in, cashiers, all these different levels. And the organization doesn't operate completely until you've got all those positions. And the bad thing about Disney or Walton is that they're men, they're imperfect, and the people they get are going to be imperfect. So the cashier isn't going to quite do it exactly like they should. The janitor isn't going to do it exactly like they should. But the great thing about Christ is that he lives forever. He fully obeyed the Father in all places. And now he puts us into him so then we can live through him. That's why Colossians 3, 3, For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. If Walt Disney was the perfect operator who had the perfect rules and was able to make every single person operate perfectly, then he would have the perfect organization. Of course, he can't do that. Jesus Christ does that. Jesus Christ lived the perfect life obeyed the Father perfectly. The Father had the perfect plan for His organization in heaven. Then Christ is building us up together in Christ, where our lives are hid with Christ and God. So Christ, Colossians 3, 4 says, Christ is our life. So since Christ obeyed the Father perfectly, Christ will operate perfectly through us. So this two, last 2,000 years from Acts 9 to now, what Christ is doing is he's getting all those positions in heavenly places built up. He says, I need a principality, I need a power, I need a might, I need a dominion, I need a throne. I need people in all these positions. And God says, I am going to, I can do that. Christ says, I can equip every single person to do every single position. The problem is our rebellion. And a lot of us won't listen to God's word. 
And so it's taken 2,000 years and counting for him to get the body of Christ built up. You notice in Colossians 3.16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. Notice that first word, let. The word of Christ can dwell in you richly in all wisdom so that God's love will come perfectly through you for all eternity. And he could fill all those positions in heavenly places, probably could have done it with the people who were alive at the time of the Apostle Paul. But because most people, Paul says, all they which be in Asia have forsaken me. Those are, all those people, Christ couldn't use in those higher positions in heavenly places. Because they refused to allow the love of Christ to come through them. They refused to let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. Let. That's all you have to do. You don't have to have the high IQ be super smart. You just have to let the word of Christ dwell in you. Get yourself out of the way. Let Christ dwell in you. And he will fully equip you. Remember Ephesians 5. Sanctify you by the washing of the water of the word that he may present to himself a church. Not having spot or wrinkle but is holy and without blemish. Look at what he says about you there in Colossians 3.12. Put on therefore as the elect of God, you are elected by God to be God's temple there in heavenly places. Holy and beloved. Remember Ephesians 1.6 said you are accepted in the beloved, you are accepted in Christ. The reason he is called the beloved is that God can demonstrate his love through Christ for all eternity. God said about Christ at, the bat, at his baptism there in Matthew 3, Thou art my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. He, in other words, God says, I am well pleased with you because now you are the man of Isaiah 66 2. I have been looking for a man with a poor and contrite spirit who would obey me. And I hadn't found one yet. God says over there in, uh, in the Psalms, He says He searched for, He looks at man. He's looked at man from heaven. Uh, I wanted to find, I know in uh, Psalm 14, that's it. In Psalm 14, and also Psalm 53. Psalm 14, verse 2. The Lord looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand and seek God. They are all gone aside. They are all together become filthy. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. That applies today. Applies today as well, yeah. In Isaiah 66, when he says, Heaven is my throne, earth is my footstool. He says, where is the place of my rest? He says, to this man will I look, even to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit and trembleth at my word. God had been looking down from heaven from the time Adam came into the world until the time of Jesus' water baptism. And all the hundreds of millions of people that lived during that time, Psalm 14, 2 and 3, they are all gone aside. They are all together become filthy. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. God says, I haven't found one person yet. But when Jesus Christ came, and he lived that perfect life, then the Spirit came upon him, and the voice came from heaven, God the Father saying, Thou art my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. He says, I am well pleased. I finally found the man who is of poor and of a contrite spirit and trembleth at my word. And because of that, you are beloved, meaning God is going to demonstrate his love through Christ for all eternity. And then Christ then takes the job of building up the temple of the Lord by taking those who have faith in him, putting them, heading their lives in Christ, with, with Christ in God. And that's why we are accepted in the Beloved. So, love and governmental structure and heavenly places, they go hand in hand. Because the whole idea of the heavenly places is a building a temple through which God can demonstrate His love throughout all eternity. Alright. That was a full hour. And we didn't even go through these verses.
But hopefully you can understand what Colossians is talking about. Um, what we're going to do then is we're going to close in a word of prayer. Or not. Actually, looking at the clock, i got 10 minutes. It's only been 50 minutes, boy. And everybody out there was going, Dog! <laughs> Thought we were through! <laughs> I'm actually going to go through these verses pretty quickly because you've really got the idea of what Colossians is about. It's the correction of love. It's not understanding that God is using us in heavenly places to demonstrate His love throughout all eternity. And He needs a perfect vessel to do that through. And the more we get the sound doctrine built up in the inner man, the greater our capacity in heavenly places for God to demonstrate His love through us. God has already saved us. He's already commended His love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So God has already made us complete in Him, Colossians 2.10. And we read the verses, circumcised spiritually, baptized spiritually, taken out the handwriting of ordinances. All that is enough for God to demonstrate His love through us for all eternity. But the greater we get the sound doctrine built up in us, the greater the capacity. Just like Walton and Disney. Hey, I got those names right that time. Mm -hmm. Walton and Disney. If they have an idea, and they say everybody else is on board with this idea, and they want to work in it. Well, maybe somebody has no education, no schooling. And he says, great, you can be the janitor. But I still need somebody to handle all the finances. I need somebody to understand how to count all this stuff. Can you count all this money? I don't know how to count. Well, you can't do it. Then he finds somebody who can count it. Okay, now you do the counting job. And then he says, okay, now i got to get somebody else to figure out how to manage the money. So that you get somebody that. you got to have different, you've got different skill levels in the organization that are required. Everybody could be bought into the idea of what Sam Walton is doing. But Walmart won't work efficiently at the company if he doesn't have anybody who knows how to count the money or anybody who knows to manage the money or anyone who knows how to scrub a toilet. He needs certain skills and all put together for the organization to run smoothly. So too, for all of us who have trusted in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for our sins, we have bought into God's ideal, basically. God will demonstrate His love through us for all eternity. But the capacity for God to use us is dependent upon how much sound doctrine we get in the inner man. The more we get in there, the more we understand, the higher position we can take and bring more glory to God for all eternity. That's why this doctrine is so important. Colossians 1.4 Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which ye have to all the saints, for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof ye heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel. You see all three, faith, hope, charity. Faith in verse 4, love or charity in verse 4, and then the hope laid up for you in heaven, verse 5. All three coming together there. Verse 8 now, Colossians 1, 8. Who also declared unto us your love in the Spirit. It's in the Spirit. It's in Christ. If it's not in Christ, God can't demonstrate His love through you for all eternity because Christ has put His love completely on... I'm sorry, God has completely put His love upon Christ. And so then it has to be the love in the Spirit. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of His will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to His glorious power. Notice, that's very similar to the prayer that we read in Ephesians 3. For God to demonstrate the love of the Spirit through you for all eternity it has to be built upon faith in the sound doctrine. So he prays that you will be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding, and then you can walk worthy of the Lord. Just like if I'm going to count the money at Walmart, I need to be filled with the wisdom and knowledge of how that works in order to walk worthy of my position. So too, you need to get sound doctrine built up in your inner man so that the love of the Spirit can be demonstrated through you 
to a greater degree for all eternity. Colossians 2, verse 2, that their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love, and unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So he says, knit together in love. But notice, the love of God only comes through the Colossians when they had the full assurance of understanding to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ. And it's in Christ are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So again, love linked together with faith and the sound doctrine, built up, strengthened with might by a spirit in the inner man, as Colossians 1.11 or, Colossians, or Ephesians 3.16 says. When you get the sound doctrine in the inner man, you are a greater vessel for God to use for all eternity, demonstrate His love through you. Just like when I get the understanding of how to run the cash register, now I'm more valuable to the Walmart organization than I was before I had that knowledge. And when I get the knowledge of how the stock market and bond market works, well then I'm even more valuable because now I can put that money in practice and get more money built up. See, the more knowledge I have, the more valuable I am to the organization. That's why those who have higher degrees and more experience in these uh, fields that generate more business or more money uh, in the long run for the company, they end up getting paid more money. It's not that the CFO of Walmart is any more important as a person than the janitor at Walmart, but it's just the CFO has a lot greater skill set so they can bring more value to the company than the janitor can. All are important positions, but there is a greater worth to the higher position. Same way with us, too. If we have the full assurance of understanding to acknowledgement of the mystery of God, and we've got all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge in us uh, from Christ, and we get that in us, then we have a greater capacity to display God's love for all eternity. Look at what he says in Colossians 2, verse 18. This is why he has to write the correction epistle for the Colossians, is that they are trying to obey ordinances and rudiments of the world and traditions of men, rather than getting the sound doctrine built up in them. And it says there in verse 18 of chapter 2, Let no man beguile you of your reward. In other words, God wants to give you a high position, a throne, a dominion, or principality. Don't let following the traditions and rudiments of this world keep you from displaying God's love to a greater extent in heaven for all eternity. Let no man beguile you of re your reward. How are they doing it? They're taking the sound doctrine of Paul's epistles, throwing it away, and they're replacing it with a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels intruding into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind, and not holding the head. Remember, we read in Colossians 1 that the head is Christ. Colossians 2.3 says, In Christ are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So if I'm getting sound doctrine built up in the inner man, then I'm holding the head by reading God's word and believing it. But if I'm going to the traditions of men, then I am not holding the head. It says, so Colossians 2.19, not holding the head, from which all the body by joints and bands having nourishment ministered and knit together increaseth with the increase of God. Remember Ephesians 2, we talked about that temple that Christ is building up in us. Or, uh, and, and God says, in Ephesians 2.21, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto a holy temple in the Lord, and whom you also are built together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. The temple grows as sound doctrine is built in the inner man so that it grows in the sense that it can demonstrate God's love in heavenly places to a greater capacity for all eternity. And so Colossians 2.19 says that if you get the sound doctrine in your inner man rather than following the rudiments or traditions of the world, then you, as part of the joints and bands of the body, have nourishment ministered in it together, and you increase with the increase of God. 
growing up as that temple of the Lord. And then, of course, Colossians 3 that we read before, verse 2, Set your affection on things above, not on things of the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. It says, Christ is your life, you are dead. Therefore, put to death the things of this life, so that Christ can dwell in you richly and come through, live through you. He says, put to death those things. And then in verse 12, put on therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved. We are beloved because we are accepted in the beloved, which is Christ. We are holy because Christ makes us holy. And when we put on bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, and forgiving one another, if any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. If you do those things, then what you're doing is you're enabling Christ to demonstrate God's love through you. As you see in verse 14. And above all these things. So you've got all these things that you should do. Mercy, kindness, humbleness of my meekness, long-suffering, forbearing, forgiving. Above all these things, put on charity. Charity, that's what the doctor, or God's love, which is the bond of perfectness, perfectness, that makes it perfect. Over there in Ephesians and chapter 4, it talks about the sound doctrine that we need to get in the inner man. And it's, it's given, uh, these gifts are given to the church, Ephesians 4, 13, till we all come in the unity of the faith, and of the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. Verse 15, Speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. Again, you've got the increase of the body growing up. And it's all about that sound doctrine, so that you grow up to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, unto a perfect man. But it's all unto the edifying of itself in love. And in Colossians 3, he says, Above all these things put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. So you've got all that sound doctrine that you get up in the inner man. And the way God is going to display His love through all eternity is when you've got that knowledge, you can work. Just like Sam Walton needs people who are, have the knowledge, understanding, skill set for every position in his organization for it to work properly. But the whole thing that puts it together is charity. It's the bond of perfectness. It's what makes it all function. You've got the knowledge. God says, knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. You've got the knowledge. That's fine. But it doesn't do a bit of good without the charity working through it. So when God's love comes, it's that bond of perfectness which causes it to be a perfect man, the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. All right. Uh, Colossians 3.19 Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. We read in Ephesians 5, the reason he mentions love. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. So we are to be showing God's love um, here on earth um, in our relationships. And then Colossians 4, verse 7. All my state shall Tychicus declare unto you, who is a beloved brother. In other words... His life is hid with Christ in God. God's love is coming through him as a result of getting that sound doctrine in the inner man. And so then he is beloved as Christ is beloved. Beloved brother and a faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord. Verse 9, with Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother. Again, mention the beloved brother there. And then verse 14, Luke, the beloved physician. 
So you've got, you understand that you got to get the sound doctrine in the inner man and then allow God to demonstrate his love through you as your life is hid with Christ and God. And he concludes Colossians here in chapter 4 with examples of people who had done just that, who got that sound doctrine built up in the inner man. And so basically what Paul's admonition of the Colossians here is that God cannot demonstrate his love through you when you are just trying to please your own self, exalting your own flesh. You notice in Colossians 2, he said about, in verse 18, let no man beguile you of your reward and a voluntary humility. He says the things of this earth, the rudiments of the world, down in verse 23, he says, which things have indeed a show of wisdom and will worship and humility and neglecting of the body, not in any honor to the satisfying of the flesh. When you follow man's traditions, churchianity, rudiments of the world, when you follow those things, all it does is satisfy your flesh. God is looking for the poor and contrite spirit he found in Christ. So when you believe God's word, allow that sound doctrine to be built up in the inner man, then you are holding the head by joints and bands having nourishment ministered and knit together, then you increase with the increase of God. So then you grow up and God's love can come through you. But the Colossians' problem was they were going back to the world, the traditions of religion, and all that did is satisfy the flesh. So then God's love can't come through them. So he's encouraging them, get in the word, get the sound doctrine built up in the inner man. It's in Christ he said in Colossians 2, 3, And Christ are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Not in churchianity, not in a denomination, not in these things of Colossians 2, 16, meat, drink, respect of a holy day, new moon, Sabbath day. He says, verse 17, those are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. So go to Christ who has all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. He is, he is the beloved. We are accepted in him. So the admonition to the Colossians is get sound doctrine built up in your, in your inner man and make decisions based upon that rather than upon traditions or religion or what people say God is all about. Because those things, Colossians 2.23, satisfy your flesh. And when you satisfy your flesh, you're not increasing with the increase of God. You are not growing to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So he concludes the book in Colossians 4, and he says, Here's Tychicus, a beloved brother. Here's Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother. Here's Luke, the beloved physician. Here are some men who have allowed Christ to dwell in them richly in all wisdom. You do the same. He says in Colossians 3.17, and we'll close with this, Whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. When you look at religion, you may say it's in the name of Jesus. The Mormons say, oh, we follow Jesus because we're the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. But in truth, they're following the rudiments of the world. They're not following what God's Word says. But if you do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, meaning you got the sound doctrine built up in your inner man, and you're allowing Christ to live that doctrine out through you, then God can use you most effectively in eternity, demonstrating his love through you. Dear Lord, we just thank you for not only your love commended toward us in that Christ died for our sins, but that Christ continues sanctifying us by washing us with the water of the word. Help us to recognize the treasures of wisdom and knowledge that are in Christ, that God's love will only come through us when we allow Christ to live out that sound doctrine through us and we walk worthy of the vocation with which we are called. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, thanks for joining us. and. Believe it or not, we actually finished the book of Colossians. So next time we'll start with, we'll go with Thessalonians, Doctrine of Hope. We'll see you then.